Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can be here again this morning, and that we can join together in study and prayer and fellowship. We know, Lord, that you have been leading and guiding us in our lives as we uh, struggle in this world of sin. You know that uh, there's much that we have to learn, and we just ask that we can obey your voice and follow you each day. We're thankful that you are there to pick us up when we fall and stumble, and that you have a purpose for us. So we just invite your presence here now in our midst as we study together. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been doing just this, this quick uh, summary and review of some of the basic points, the outline of what we have studied over the last year. And there's there's lots and lots of detail. So obviously, we, we're not going to review all of that detail again. So we, we started looking at, uh, yesterday we went through the three touches and then into chapter 11. And uh, we're going to try to finish off chapter 11 and uh, chapter 12 here just as a quick review. So one of the things that we saw when we were going through Daniel 11 is that there was many details that were missed. One of the things that we we noted was, of course, this this chart here, which I'm just going to look back at. This chart that ties together this 666 years with in this structure of these even four times. So we're dealing with the period from the Roman Jewish League, uh, all of that period up until the taking away of the daily. And so that 666 years that Miller noted, which is an inclusive count, he just thought it was a cardinal count, it's inclusive, is part of what we see in Daniel chapter 11. That is, Daniel chapter 11 is dealing with this connection between uh, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, that is, the sons of the breakers of thy people, that is, Rome, and the breakers of thy people being Babylon. And so there's there's all of these different connections. And so we're not going to have time to go through them. Uh, but anybody who's going to spend time uh, studying chapter 11 needs to recognize the Battle of Actium and the Battle of Pharsalus and how they're connected in this period, even for a time. So there's lots of little details there they will want to touch on. Now, when we get to, um, so we had, we, and we had gone through this, uh, um, that, they, that we went through some of the verses twice, that is, we had different present truth applications for these verses. But the historic application is the same in each interpretation, just a, a different uh, present truth application. And then we have the reason that Jerusalem is destroyed has to do with this league, right? It's going to address that. And then you have um, in verse 25, so we'll start reading here. And he, that is pagan Rome under Octavian, who's the king of the north, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. Uh, that's Egypt under Antony. So right now, I mean, the, the present truth application, you're going to see the United States and the papacy against the Soviet Union. So this this battle between the King of the North and the King of the South is, is going to be the end of the King of the South. So what would this be typifying? Just, I mean, we can see there in this historic application. So it's going to be typifying Daniel chapter 11, verse 40b, right? Does that make sense to people? That you're going to have this earlier history continue to be repeated. That's why we are shown this history. This history is typical. All these things are types, typos in, in samples, right, of, of things that are going to happen at the end of the world. That's the purpose of prophecy. That's the purpose of history is to give us illustrations of what is coming. And 
and we can see that this history that has occurred has typified something in our history, the, the present time in which we're in. So we're in, we're caught up in this, this history of Daniel 11, verse 40b onward, right, which is the history uh, addressing the Sunday law. Now, we know that uh, the Soviet Union is going to be conquered, right? That happens in this history, that is, Egypt is going to be conquered. Now, how do we understand, so we, so we have Egypt here, represent the king of the south, which is atheism. How do we reconcile the idea that uh, atheism is conquered, but it's still going to be part of the threefold union? I know it's kind of a, a question that um, we should have an answer to, but uh, we may not have thought about it. So in this threefold union, is are the globalists conquered in order to be a part of that union is the question. They have something to do with the, <clears throat> the, the whirlwind, the ships of Chittim, and something else. Okay. So, so we saw in 1989, we're going to have the fall of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union falls, but... Atheism is not conquered. It's going to move from the Soviet Union to the United Nations, right? And then we're going to see that after the United States reaches its hand to join with the papacy prior to 1989, that it's also going to join with the dragon power, right? Spiritualism. And, the, and we mark that at 9-11. Right. That's that's how we've understood it. So so when it's defeated, it it's not really defeated in, in the ultimate sense. Now, when we look at, at Egypt, when it's defeated by Rome, how does that parallel with the fall of the Soviet Union as far as it being defeated? What what is it that Rome is defeating? Like, does Egypt still exist? The question again, what is it? Rome defeats yeah what is it what is it like because we're dealing here with history that is become symbolic right yeah yeah so so we know that egypt is going to be conquered by rome it's going to become part of the roman empire that's what what's going to happen right i mean it in some ways it, it happens gradually and slowly and there's different stages and so forth but we we finally look at the defeat of egypt it's <laughs> it's now part of the roman empire in this history yeah. So, so what is that really symbolizing? Like, what does it mean that we have this threefold union between the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Um, especially if you consider that, you know, the papacy really conquers the United States in some ways, and the papacy also conquers uh, spiritualism. Right? So, but there's also a union where the United States reaches its hands across the gulf and the abyss to join with these powers. So how do we reconcile this different type of imagery in join with in, these powers or with the one power, the papacy? Well, any of these powers. We have two different sort of illustrations. One is we have an illustration of them being conquered. Right here, Egypt is conquered. It's it's not a league with 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 Rome, right? It's conquered by Rome. And then we see the United States is also seen as conquered by the papacy in some of our illustrations, right? But also the United States is the one that reaches its hand across the gulf and the abyss to join hands with the Roman power and with, with uh, spiritualism. So why are these different illustrations? What are they trying to illustrate? Okay, I'll, I'll put the question in, in this way. So who is the enemy at the end of the world of God's people? Satan. Okay, well, Satan is, yeah. So so we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So we have spiritualism. So we would look at the World Economic Forum and all of those things associated with uh, globalism, right? That's yeah. the enemy. So we, people, some people are worried about the New World Order or what's going to happen with uh, the World Economic Forum. So that becomes a focus for some people. Others focus upon the papacy itself. The papacy is the one really behind it all, 
And so the papacy is the enemy, and that's where we watch whatever the papacy is doing. But some people focus upon apostate Protestantism in the United States. They're looking for what's happening in the United States, especially with the Republicans, the religious right, or whatever they want to call it, the evangelicals. And, and so they're looking for Sunday legislation uh, from, from that direction. So some people have quite different focuses on, on how they perceive the enemy, right? So there's this, this enemy. Now, we know Satan's behind it all, but we, we see this illustrated in different ways, right? So we see the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. There's this unity that comes about, but yet they're enemies of each other, and they, they get conquered by the papacy, but sometimes they're seen as being in union with each other. So how do we resolve that? How do we understand that? Well, they're unified by compromise. Okay, so they're unified by compromise. So one is they're not really united in the truest sense. They're all looking out for their own interests, right? They're defeated by compromise as well. I think I was wanting to say mm -hmm. you have the okay. example in the, of the Ten Kings as well during the 1260. Yeah. That's, um, well, the Ten Horns, whatever it is, typifying the Ten, mm -hmm. the, then the world to give their power to the beast. So we have, we have that example there in an agreement and to mm -hmm. uh, offer their support to them. Yeah. So I, I sometimes think that this is unclear. Right. That that is, we sort of hold these different views that, that we, we haven't really reconciled. We haven't really pulled together because the question, the big question always for me as a Seventh-day Adventist is how does the Sunday law come about in a secular society? How is that going to occur? How how religious does the society have to become? And And we know that it's a grassroots movement, this Sunday law. Right. It's not it's not coming from the top down. Yet we we know that the papacy is definitely behind it, right? Which is kind of the top. So so we have what I would consider a lot of conflicting ideas on the surface, and that there has to be some sort of unifying way of looking at uh, this Sunday law on how it's going to unfold. And you know, one of the things that we know as Seventh Day Adventists in reading the Spirit of Prophecy is that. Many people in the Adventist church are, are not just going to support the Sunday law, but are going to be responsible for initiating it, right? That is, in the compromise of Seventh-day Adventists, they're going to see this as a way to evangelize, which makes no sense, but, but that's how it's, it's going to be seen, right? That they're going to see things much the same way that the world sees things. And so they're going to see a Sunday law as a necessity. And so the church, many in the church are not, are not just going to be, you know, accepting of it. No, they're, they're, they're not just that they're not going to hinder it, but they're actually going to promote it. So this becomes a very complex idea. And I believe that there's all kinds of distractions out there to take the focus of, off what we need to focus on. So what is it we need to focus on? What is it that Daniel has been pointing us to symbolically? Like if we're going to deal with Daniel's last vision, what is the whole purpose of this vision? We, we've talked a bit about, you know, that there's all this symbolic language, right, that, that's, that's used in Scripture, these symbols. They represent something. This history represents something. We have in chapter 10, we have the three touches, and, and we can see how the prophecies are connected to our Christian experience. So we, we could get bogged down in the details of, you know, all of these, these prophets. I mean, we, we need the details. They're, they're important. But they're showing us something, right? We need to see. We can't just look at the trees. We need to see the forest. So what is it that we see here in this conquering of Egypt by Rome? So think about some of the history of that. So why why is Octavian and Antony at odds with each other? Over a woman? 
No, no. So, so they were part of an agreement. So the second triumvirate. So what's the second triumvirate? Dwight or Stephen, you guys remember the names. So we got Antony, Octavian, and what's the other guy's name? So Lepidus? I think so. Lepidus? Lepidus. Yeah. Okay. So, so originally, Octavian and Antony are in, in an agreement. They're, they, they form this triumvirate having to do with the death of Julius Caesar, right? Basically, it was to deal with the aftermath of his death and uh, to punish the enemies, uh, the ones who were involved in, in executing or murdering Julius Caesar, I guess it's probably the right, right word, right? And they shall speak lies at one table. They both have their own agenda, but we're going to see the power that, that conquers in the end is the king of the north, that is the papacy. So in this illustration here, we can see that the globalists are conquered by the papacy, right? So how, how, do, how, do, you, how do they conquer them? Well, in what way? Yeah, so that's kind of the question. How does this conquering occur? It, what does it look like? Does it look like the redistribution of wealth, which seems to be what the papacy wants to do? I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with economics. So, so we have the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum, we, we can say, that kind of represents the uh, globalism, right? Um, in, in, when we look at this, so let's look at this, these verses here. So we have uh, Octavian, he's the USA in the papacy, and this is going to be against the USSR. So we have uh, Antony represents the Soviet Union because he's Egypt, atheism. And, and so Daniel 11, verse 40, we're B, right? That's going to be the time of the end, 1989. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great arm, mighty army, but he, Antony, shall not stand and Octavian defeated him in the Battle of Actium, 31 BC. So we mark that as November 9th, 1989. For they, that is Octavian and Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. So why do we have Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa here as they? And we're paralleling them with John Paul II and Ray Reagan. Uh, whether that's correct or not, but why did we do that? I don't know. Anybody else? So Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, he was a Roman general statesman architect who was a close friend, son-in-law, and lieutenant to the Roman Emperor Augustus. So Agrippa is well known for his important military victories, notably the Battle of Actium in 31 BC against the forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Right. So that's why we put him in there. So we, we put him in there because it talks about they. So, so we, we put him in here and then we're going to say, well, that's uh, the United States and and the papacy in 1989, whether that's correct or not, whether we should put Marcus Hispanius Agrippa in there or not. That's what we did. Right. So because he's the general. OK. And then we he, they shall forecast his devices against him. So there's this plan of. Uh, Octavian and Agrippa there to go against Antony. And we have this forecasting his devices. So we look at this with what's going to happen with the USSR in 1989. So this is prior to 1989. And they, that is Rome, the papacy, that feed of the portion of Egypt's, the Soviet Union's meat, Rome was dependent upon Egypt for grain. The papacy and the USSR both support Marxist ideology. Shall destroy him. Anthony commits suicide August 1st, 30 BC in Egypt. We line that up with December 25th, 1991. And his Octavian's papacy's army in the USA shall overflow, which is a symbol of the Sunday law, which we mark as 9-11. And many countries conquered by Rome, right? It says counties, but it should be countries. Countries of the USSR conquered by the papacy shall fall down, uh, be divided up, partitioned, slain. And uh, we look at that word there as halal, 
Egypt is conquered by Rome. So the country is conquered by Islam or the papacy in our history. So, so there's a lot in there. Now, I don't know if this is how we looked at this, these few verses are correct as far as the present truth application. This is just what we did. But what we can say is that, um, and if we go on here, it says, both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. That is, they both desire control of the Roman world, and they shall speak lies at one table, form false alliances. We look at that as 9-11. But it shall not prosper. These agreements would, wouldn't last as per Actium. That is, we look at that as the end of the 2030 agenda. For, that is certainly yet an iteration at the end, the extremity, February 15th, 1798, referring to the end of that uh, 1260, shall be at the time appointed, the end of the prophetic periods, October 22nd, 1844. So the way that we look at it is this is this period from 1798 to 1844, then he, the king of the north, return into his land with great uh, shall he, the king of the north, return into his land with great riches and his pagan Rome's heart, in our history, papal Rome's heart, shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do uh, and return to his own land. So when we looked at this historically, we could see that this can't be talking about, as some people say, being against the holy covenant, being like Augustus, because... He's not, right? Uh, it, it, he's, he's, he's too early for that. And so we look at this as, as showing history that's going to happen later on, right? Now, but we can see here that we have this union. And I know this is all roundabout and, and long sort of explanation. But this history of what happens with Rome and, and Egypt, Rome coming into power, is paralleling what's going to be happening at the Sunday Law. So you have Rome represents the papacy. Egypt, we'll say, you know, the globalists, right? So that's what's being addressed in this section. So would we look at the globalists as the true enemy? What, what is the purpose of the globalists? What is in Satan's plan? What, what is the globalism doing? What is wokeism doing? All of this communistic stuff. What is, what is its purpose? Is its purpose to have us controlled by communism? Is that Satan's purpose of communism and globalism and wokeism? Could be that. Thing you mentioned, you know, I want something the opposite. They do the opposite. Yeah. yeah, you want something else. So, what what the purpose of these things is to basically destroy order, right? To bring chaos. It's working. Yeah, that I mean, that's what it, it's meant to do. Like all of this wokeism, uh, you know, we we wouldn't need all. We wouldn't we wouldn't have prejudice in the United States and any sort of major scale if it wasn't for wokeism right not just but even earlier wokeism right this idea that um you know there's white privilege and all these types of things all it does is it keeps stirring up this division and hatred right instead of instead of judging people by their character we ju judge them by their color and before we used to judge black people, I guess, and now we judge white people or whatever. No right? matter what it just creates say, division. Can't convince. No matter what it what you try to say, you can't convince them otherwise either. <laughs> yeah. So, and and so even if we look at like Trudeau in Canada, um, his policies are to destroy the economy, right? That. That's, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's for sure. Like, it, I, I don't, I mean, obviously he might be naive and really believe those things, but behind that, the people who are behind it, the person or the being behind it, Satan, he puts these ideas into people's minds. Even if those people may think that what they're doing is good, Satan knows the result is going to be destruction. It's going to be 
death and famine and disorder and riots and so forth. And, and that suits the purposes that Satan ultimately has through the Catholic Church, through this false religion, to have people turn to the papacy, right, to a false Christianity to solve the problems. So this is, is basically what we, we understand, right? This is what we understand about, about prophecy at the end of the world. And so when we try to look at what people say their goals are, you know, we can get really, really caught up in fearing, you know, the World Economic Forum or fearing you know, all these different groups that have all these different agendas. But one is we shouldn't be fearing anything except God, right? We're not going to be able to stop all of these things that are happening or could be happening. Some of them are true. Some of them are false, right? A lot of it is just misinformation to distract us. All kinds of theories out there about, you know, what what the government's planning and what the government's doing that aren't true, right? But we know that there's something even much darker that that needs to be our focus, and that is to get our attention off Christ and onto ourselves and onto the worries and concerns in the world around us that we have no control over, mm -hmm. right? Like the disciples so, in the sh like the disciples in the boat on the stormy sea of Galilee. Yeah. Now um, focusing on the storm. Yeah. Now some of this stuff we went over more recent, right? Because we went through Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on Revelation. So some of this would be fresher in your minds. But we had this this section here, which I thought was really important. This was Daniel 11, verse 29. And uh, there was different ways in which we could read this passage. Right. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Right. So this this verse, Daniel 11, 29, we had in the historical application different ways that we could look at this, which, of course, would affect the present truth application. So we could have at the time appointed November 9th, 1989. That's what we believe the time appointed here is referring to in, in, in this context. That it's, it's referring to not the end of the, th the, the time, that is the 360 years, as Smith would have it. He's going to say the time appointed is going to be uh, when the capital moves from Rome to Constantinople, right? That's where he's going to mark the time appointed. But we're saying, no, that this is referring to uh, the time appointed, or which is uh, the end of, uh, well, it's going to be Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? So it's the, this other time appointed. And um, so he, the papacy, the USA king of the north, shall return, come toward the south, Soviet Union, but it shall not be as the former. So there we had the former being the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, in that it is a spiritual north and south and not literal. So that's why it shall not be as the former, because it's spiritual in this context, or as the latter. Right. So it's the, the fall of Western Rome would be the latter in this case, that it is not pagan or literal Rome, but papal, spiritual Rome. So that's one option. And, and we had and or. So we can say, well, it can be this and maybe also this or just this. So at the time appointed, again, November 9th, 1989, he, the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, shall return, come towards the south. Again, the USSR, but it shall not uh, be as the former, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, in that it is spiritual north and south and not literal, or as the latter, 1798. So we just said instead of the latter being the fall of Western Rome, this would be the fall of the papacy, in that it is the north against the south and not the south against the north. Right. So, so we looked at these different options, and then we had another and or, at the time appointed, November 9th, 1989. He, the papacy in the USA, king of the north, that's all going to be the same. But the latter shall not be as the former in that the north and south are reversed. Right. So this one, we actually 
where it says uh, the latter shall not be as it shall not be as the former or as the latter. In this one, we actually change the translation, but the latter shall not be as the former. Right. So it's different. And then we have another one, which is the same uh, kind of idea. The last shall not be as the first. It's just another way of saying the latter shall not be as the former. So here, when we have the latter, the latter could be 1989, the former being 1798. And, and this is kind of the one I like the most. This is where we take, um, or the last shall not be as the first, in that the north and south are reversed. So the last being 1989, the first being 1798. It's just basically the same, same kind of idea, right? So we're saying that there's this omega and alpha, the last and the first. Um, and then we say, or not, right? So we just don't take this. So either we, we accept this idea of 30 AD. So this is basically Smith's view, I think. Yeah. Okay. So so I think that was a really important uh, verse. Person would have to spend more time on it. And then we have this whole section, starting with the ships of Kittim, in which the uh, the ships of Kittim, this is referring to the German invasions, right? Vandals uh, coming against Western Rome. So we, we would pair this up with Revelation chapter 9. Like this is what's being talked about. And, and so in these verses, it's going to go back to, to this history of the transition with the fall of Rome to the rise of the papacy. So, of course, verse 30 is essential in, to, in order to understand Verse 31, right? So uh, they shall come against him, that is Western Rome, and he shall be grieved and returned and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, right? So Western Rome is going to be grieved, return, and we have this as 410 AD, that is paganism will continue to have indignation. So this is continuation of the 1260 years of the daily even after the fall of Western Rome in 476 AD, right? So we're going to see that this is going to continue. So against the Holy Covenant, uh, paganism hates, though it coexists with Christianity. We have, uh, it equals something. We didn't put what a present truth application was there. So shall he paganism do, that is, continue after 476. And, and he, paganism, shall even return uh, this is dealing with uh, Clovis's baptism on December 25th, 508, and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, that is, apostate Christianity. So, so this becomes the setup for verse 31. Right? And so we spent a lot of time recently looking at these, so we're not going to really go through too much detail here. But we can What's see that? then... What's that? What was that? I just noticed paganism equals Pope John Paul or something. Else. Yeah, the papacy in our time, especially John Paul II. Equals paganism. So, yeah, so yeah. In, in the historic thing, pa pagan Rome mm -hmm. is going to be typifying papal Rome in our history. Well, that's new to me. What's that? Well, that is a new concept to me. Okay, my, so, my, so I'm just a beginner here, really. Yeah. Okay, so the way that we looked at the historic application, when we looked at uh, pagan Rome and this history, that that was history. Doesn't it, it doesn't address the papacy, right? At, at this point, because we're just dealing with paganism. But paganism, pagan Rome, its actions are going to typify in the present truth application. Because you're going to have, look at it this way, pagan Rome is going to fall, and it's going to fall because of the Vandals, right? Right. And then you're going to have a philosophy that comes in. We, we put their German modernism as sort of a parallel to the Vandals. That is, there's going to be, uh, in the West, Western Rome, it's going to represent what happens to Christianity in the West. So there is there is a sort of a fall that occurs um, because of these philosophies. So it's 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 a little more spiritual 
then then we generally look at it. What you're saying is papacy adopts the principles of paganism and uses them to bring about the fall of the U.S. somehow, the Protestantism falling to the Sunday law? Well, well, here we're dealing with more with the fall of Christianity. Yeah, so it is going to be a philosophy that destroys Christianity, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we're sort of looking at it in, in this part, in that aspect, whether that's the best way to explain it or not. But we're dealing with the fall of the papacy, right? Not so much by military conquest, even though the Vandals represent military conquest for the fall of pagan Rome. But it, it explains how it continues, that paganism still continues. And then it's in historically, it's going to take the, the, the church is paganism in Christian garb, right? So we yeah, have this, that's the phrase this Christian philosophy that, yeah. that, that has dominated in our history. Papacy is paganism in Christian garb. Yeah. Right. So, so when we parallel with paganism, what happens with paganism when it falls, we can see that there's a parallel there with the papacy in our history. Okay. Yeah, right. That, that it, it continues okay. this philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so okay. Clovis's baptism is, of course, paganism being Christianized, right? December 25th, 508. And then when he has intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, that is apostate Christianity historically, we can see that that intelligence or communication influence exists in our history. So that's going to be John Paul II and Reagan. And so we had some dates there, June 7, 1982, when they first meet. So, so apostate Christianity in the his, historic part is going to be Protestant America. So we can see that Protestantism is combining with papalism, just as uh, paganism combined with apostate Christianity. So it's, 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 a, it's a different kind of parallel than we, we've generally used in that history. The, the word intelligence, can you say a little bit about that? It just means communicate. Okay. Right. They're going to talk to each other. Right. In, we put their influence, right? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it can be seen sort of as a co covert communication, but really it's, you know, the why they put the word intelligence there. I mean, obviously we have the idea of intelligence now in the sense of, you know, spies and so forth, but you know, I was going to yeah, say that's, that's the word the King CIA James CIA cold, covert operations. Yeah. That's how we think of the word intelligence, but it's not really the intent of, of the word originally. So if I just go here, yeah, this nine, nine, five, it says, to separate mentally or distinguish or understand, attend, consider, be cunning. So there's a, that part of it, diligently, direct, discern, eloquent, feel, inform, instruct, have intelligence. These are different ways in which it's translated. The idea is just to separate mentally. So there's some kind of communication or influence that happens, right? That's the way that I, that, that I would take that when they have intelligence. So there's this influence between these two powers. So when Clovis is baptized, this, there's this connection between this new Christianized paganism and, and the papacy, right? So they're just going to be working together, right? Which is what we see historically. Okay. Yeah, so, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the purpose of this uh, review is to kind of make these things clear. Now, um, of this chart here, uh, what you see here, November 22nd, 977 BC, 1453 years to the fall of Western Rome, and then 977 years uh, to the fall of Constantinople in 453. So there's this little puzzle, or whatever you want to call it. So so you've got 977 BC is connected to 476 AD by 1453 years. That's going to be obviously uh, the division of the Northern Kingdom, and that's the date in which uh, 
uh, Jeroboam is going to offer on the altar in Bethel, right? In the prophecy of Josiah. And then we had, uh, he's going to be grieved. That's going to be 395. Return is 410 and have indignation is 476 to 508. So that's the, those periods of time. We're just going to say he shall be grieved, return and have intel and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So then you have the, the fall of Constantinople in 453. There's 476 years to the Lateran Treaty, right? So there's all these different uh, symbols involved there. And the Lateran Treaty happens over a period of 116 days from February 11th to June 7th, 1929. And then there's 53 years to John Paul II and Reagan meeting, right? So there's just a, there's just some details there. Not all of them are super important, but we can see that there's there's some value in understanding that. And then when we looked at uh, this uh, 1260 years from January 1st, 538 to December 31st, 1779. So we're just going to mark that as the end of that's the period of 1260 if we're just taking it from January 1st to December 31st. If you count uh, Daniel 11, verse 30, the lexical sum, all the Strong's numbers added together is 73,909 plus 490. And that leads us to September 11th, 2001. Whether that's really significant or not, we don't know, but that's what we drew, drew in that diagram. Now, of course, this part, Daniel 11, verse 31, arms shall stand on his part. So this is the military might of France, right? Starting the 1290 and the 1335 of Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12. We, we parallel this with November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991. That uh, because we have that December 25th symbol, right? Shall stand on his part that is on the, behalf of papal Rome, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So we dealt with this as the Edict of Theodosius in 391, uh, which is 911, the Patriot Act, and shall take away the daily in 508, which typifies the tide being turning its wokeism in our history, right? And they shall place uh, the abomination that make it desolate, set up the papacy and power over the church, state, and conscience of Christians in 538. Um, there's a Sunday law in 538. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, uh, shall he, the papacy, the spiritual king of the north, corrupt by flatteries. Right. So this happened historically. But the people that do know their God, that is the woman in the wilderness, 144,000 in our history, shall be strong and do. And so they're going to... Uh, be faithful followers of God, remain faithful, preach the truth, and win many true converts. So that's the history of the 1260 of what, what happens, which is going to parallel our time. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil, um, many days, right? So dealing just dealing with the 1260 years. So it's going to talk about the papacy uh, being set up, right? And and then that period of 1260 years of what's going to happen. So historically, we can take all we we need to understand the historical interpretation in order to understand the application to our time. Now, as far as some of the present truth application that we put in here, you know, some of some of it's still tentative. Like we don't. Fully, we're not fully settled on everything that we've we've put there in red, but we're we're pretty solid on the historical uh, application. So when they shall fall and be hoping with a little help, so who's going to be to fall and be hoping with a little help? That's the earth helps the woman, right? Revelation twelve sixteen, but many that is the majority of Christianity shall cleave to them such as do wickedly against the Holy Covenant, who's they're going to cleave to with flatteries and some of them of understanding 
that is the wise, shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. So we're saying that there is a group called the wise that are going to go through this experience, right? that they're, they're going to stumble. But this is to try them, to purge them, to make them white. That is the three angels' messages from 1798 to 1844. Uh, even at the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So the time of the end, 1798, the time appointed, the Moed there, is October 22nd, 1844. So all of that, Smith would, as far as the historical application, generally have the same idea. He's going to have some things that are a bit different. But he's going to see that this is the papacy, right? He's not necessarily going to understand uh, the the time appointed and uh, the time of the end in the way that we do. He's, he's he's just going to see, I think, them both as the same period. But but generally, the idea that this is the papacy, where the difference came in was when it says, "And the king, that is papal Rome, the king of the north, shall do according to his will." Smith says, if it said a king. You know, then it would be introducing a new uh, power, which he says is France. But the thing is, it doesn't say a king, right? It says the king. So it, it, it never really made sense to me how he could just do that. But, you know, so because it doesn't say a king. So we know that this is not France. So we've gone through this recently. right? So when he exalts himself and magnifies himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. It's describing the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and also is seen in the Great Controversy chapter 3. So Ellen White's going to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and show how there's this transition from pagan to papal Rome, and, um, and, and definitely she applies this language uh, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Daniel 11, verse 36, she puts them together. So it's pretty hard to say that it's France. And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. But historically, that's the 1260 years of papal persecution. And, um, and it's going to be accomplished in 1798. Uh, for that, that is determined. Uh, 45 years between 1290 and 1335 shall be done. So we're saying that 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 is determined is that 45 years uh, dealing with the 1290 and the 1335, right? So it's referring to something that's going to be explained in more detail in chapter 12. Neither he, neither shall he, pay, papal Rome, regard the gods of his fathers, right? Nor the desire of women that is, we say that that actually is not so much dealing with uh, not uh, like celibacy, but actually the rejection of the promised seed, the everlasting gospel. Nor regard any God, uh, for he shall magnify himself above all. Right. So this is yeah. this, this regard the desire of what is the regard the desire of the Protestant churches. Pay respect to that. Well, to make sure that he's well just normally we would look at the desire of women as yeah, I understand what you're asking. So normally people would just say, "Oh, the papacy is celibate," right? So they would take it literally, okay? And then we no, say women about re represent about women represent most churches, most right? Okay, but the desire of women is is um. When, when the gospel is given to Eve, she's going to have a man-child, right? She's going to have her seed is, is the gospel, right? Christ. Like, and when, when Cain is born, she says, well, God has given me a man-child, right? Believing that he was the promised seed. So when we look at the desire of woman in this context, it is really that desire of the promised seed, in a sense, in every child born, there is this promise that this could be the deliverer, the Messiah, right? Representing the gospel. So that that's how we, I, we took this. This yeah, is mostly I, my I, idea. I can see how that could be an interpretation. Okay. Yeah. So, but in the context here, it's addressing the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages in our history is how we looked at it. So there's a rejection of the promised seed or the rejection of the everlasting gospel. 
Very nice. Yeah. And then, nor regard any God, for he that is the man of sin, Satan, shall magnify himself above all. Right. So this is, is about Satan, right? This is in the place of Christ. So the rejection of the promised seed, which in a sense is Satan's seed, right? His, his message, his gospel. And Gloria poses an interesting question. I saw the in the chat. What, what's that? The question Angela poses in the chat looks interesting. Ricky, when you... Okay, there's a question. Okay. Um, so Halpin, with a little help, has always puzzled me. Could it mean only briefly what would become, what, what would, could it mean only briefly would what we to become America would be a refuge for those? Yeah, so I, I look at Halpin with a little help to be America. That's, that's where I look at Halpin with a little help. So that's during the 1260 that the earth helps the woman. Yeah. So that's that's going to be that period of time in which we have that opportunity. The United States provides that opportunity through its constitution, freedom of you know, religious freedom. So is that I think what she's asking? OK, now would he the papal power, but shall he do the papal power? Uh, against the most strongholds. And now it says in the most strongholds in the King James, but it's actually against. So we take these as places of refuge, the truth of God's word, where persecuted Christians have fled, right? So historically, so it has to do with the United States, but also mostly God's word. Uh, and he's going to do it with a strange God, that is the syncretistic Christian God, that we have this mixture of paganism and Christianity whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause, he shall, it says cause them, but cross that out. And to rule, we cross that out. So he shall, uh, what, did, what did we do here? Exercise dominion. So we, so, so he shall exercise dominion over many and shall divide the land for gain. So this is dealing with what happens uh, historically during the 1260 years with the papacy. So their, their attack upon Christianity. So it's just describing more of the work of the papacy. Now we did some present truth applications here, which I'm not going to look at in detail, but basically you can see that this parallels what's going to happen with the Sunday law, right? That, that history of the papacy is going to be repeated Ellen White says the history and connection, much of the history and connection with this prophecy will be repeated. Quoting Daniel uh, chapter 11, verse 31 to 39, I think. Right. So, so this history that has happened is going to be repeated in connection with the Sunday law. That's just simply how it is. And then we had these, uh, this chart here addressing this period of time. So you can see that we, we put this on a line. We have a darkness that begins in 410. There's 66 years to the time of the end that we're marking here uh, as 476. So this is the fall of Western Rome. So it becomes a time of the end. There's 32 years to Clovis's baptism. And you're going to see that the seat then is given in 476. We're going to say that, that uh, the fall of Western Rome now, of course, we could look at it earlier, Clovis handing the seat over to. So this is the dragon giving him his power, his seat, and great authority. So we're going to see the seat of Rome. That, that's first given. So we could put it even earlier. But once Western Rome falls, the papacy, that is the Roman bishop, steps in. And, and we know that the donation of Constantine is a fake document where it says that Constantine gives... Uh, the papacy uh, Rome, right? People familiar with what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. Can you explain it a bit, Stephen, what you think about this with the uh, seat and the donation of Constantine? Well, they didn't really officially give them their seat, but uh, mm -hmm. it sort of was believed for quite some time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so I mean, does it make sense to put the seat here as 476 once Western Rome falls? You really have the seat really being recognized by Justinian. In a sense, he, yeah. he's the one that chooses Rome over Constantinople as being the main bishop. Okay. Yeah, so there's kind of a progression with the seat itself, right? I mean, first, obviously, Constantine needs to move the capital to Constantinople from Rome, right? Yes. Then Rome has to fall, and then yes. Justinian is going to sort of recognize that. Now, the donation of Constantine is a document. When would that have been forged? Because it's a forgery. I think it was around the 800s. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. So... Uh, after the time of um, uh, Charlemagne, right? Yes. In that history. Yeah. Okay. And Charlemagne, is is he um, crowned on December 25th, 800? Is that the date? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's a progression there. But he's going to give him his power, right? That's going to be 508. So that's dealing with military power. The seat, we're, we're, you know, that's going to over happen over a period of time. And then the great authority, which is something that's not his to give. The dragon gives these to the beast of Revelation 13 that comes out of the sea, right? The well, I, the, the, the great authority, is that not 533? Well, we, we looked, yeah, so it could be 533, but we put it here dealing with the Sunday law. So, yeah, because you're dealing with um, Justinian's, Justinian's decree. Yeah, Justinian's decree. But but we put it here as as the Sunday law itself, May 7th, 538. So, yeah, so you do have Justinian's uh, decree, but because that allows for persecution, right? Yes, it does. Okay. But then we're going to have the Sunday law itself. So, again, some of these things to give a specific date like this, it, you know, it's it's just more symbolic than anything. And then we have a mirror of this with uh, the Imperial Edict of Focus in 606, which is where many people had begun to count the 1260 for the papacy. In the time of Miller, a lot of people were counting it from 606. And then the Pantheon is going to be given to the papacy on August 1st, 608. And then Charlemagne, December 25th, it's right there, the power, right? So we, we see that there's this the great authority seat and power are also listed on uh, this sort of mirror, I guess, a repeat. And, and then we have the 1290 right there and the 1335. So and the 1260, all part of this. Now, of course, we, we've dealt a lot with verses 40 to 45, so there's nothing really new there on how we understand these verses. But we do see that there is a parallel to that in, within the movement itself, is how we've understood this. So we see that, so we've made an application of that history to our movement, dealing with uh, the time of the end, being August 29th to November 9th, 2019. And that's going to be that that time prophecy of Parminders, right? Uh, show the King of the South, we're going to put the Omega movement in there. Um, war against the King of the North, FFA is going to be the King of the North in this context. And she'll come against him, King of the North, then is going to come against the King of the South, that is Parminders wokeism, like a whirlwind. Right, September 7th, 2019 to November 9th, 2019. Uh, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, that's the history. But Jeff's going to call out Parminder's movement on September 7th, 2019. And then there's going to be the wrestling of control over FFA's assets. Um, and the reasserting of July 18th, 2020 prediction rejected by Omega. So whether this makes sense or not to people, that's just an application that we made of it. And, and then we could show that this uh, 776 days after the fall of the Berlin Wall to the USSR ceasing to exist, 777 inclusive days, parallels that period of the pandemic, 
uh, which is symbolized as in Odilio's study dealing with the mandates uh, from November to December uh, 25th, 2021. So whether some of these things make sense to people or not, uh, the most important part is understanding the historical application. And uh, so these are some charts dealing with the Soviet-Afghan war and some of these numbers. I'm not going to go in detail here. So, so we've looked at these, these verses in detail. And when we get to chapter 12, uh, some of the things that uh, we noted in chapter 12 that are important. Uh, we didn't do a completely like a present truth application of it. We just say that there's a close of probation for the movement that parallels a close of probation for the world. We could also say a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventism at the Sunday Law. So, you know, some of this stuff is unfinished. And as I go through and write this out, uh, you know, we're probably going to come back to some of this in, in, in our other discussions. So at some point, I think we'll actually go over it again. The idea was we were going to have a camp meeting like next week, um, which we're not having, uh, where we were going to try to to hammer some of this stuff out in person. But at some time, we will do that. We will actually go through uh, this, this document once it's done. Uh, we will do it in person for whoever can be there at the camp meeting. Um, so, so it's not really finished in that sense, but a lot of this, this groundwork has been done for us through these studies. So we, we went through it, pretty much our understanding of Daniel chapter 12 isn't all that different from, uh, from what we've understood in the past. And we do have some symbols that are attached to it. And there are some verses that definitely we have a view on that wouldn't generally be understood in Adventism. So if we look at Daniel 12, verse 5 to 7, for instance, then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall be the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear uh, um, by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, Seventh-day Adventists are going to look time, times, and a half, and, and we become really sort of uh, myopic, right? We, we see 70 years. We think it's always the 70 years Babylonian captivity. We see time, times, and a half. It must be the same 1260 period. But of course, we know this is for the scattering of the power of the holy people, which is re referring to what happens under paganism, not under papalism. Papalism is going to trample underfoot, right? Tread underfoot the holy city 42 months. It doesn't do a work of scattering. That's the work of, of the first 1260 of the 2520 or northern Israel, right? So, so that's something that we understand about Daniel chapter 12 that uh, Miller had a partial understanding of that. He, he saw it as dealing with the first, uh, you know, with paganism, though he divided it up differently. He, he didn't see it as a continuous period, which didn't make any sense, but that's just what he did. And Hiram Metzen brought that out. Now, we did make a historical or a present truth application to this. So one of the things we see in this history is there is a parallel to Daniel. So Daniel chapter 12, I think the most important thing to recognize is that this is going to be the sealing up of Daniel's prophecy, which are going to be opened up in the book of Revelation. And you're going to see this book sealed with seven seals, right? And then you're going to see the seals. And then you're going to see this little book opened in um in the hand of Christ, right, in, in Revelation chapter 10. And so those seals, chapter 8 and 9, are extremely important in connection with these prophecies. Right? So again, we're just doing a summary and a quick review, but we need to understand those prophecies. We need to understand the connection between what's in Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10. 
they're a very similar scene. They're not identical. They're similar. One is in the time when Daniel is sealed up. He's given his, this vision. John sees a vision, again, of, of Christ with the book opened. So the book of Daniel is unsealed in the book of Revelation. But then you're going to have the seven thunders are going to be sealed up. And in our history, the seven thunders are going to be unsealed, right? So we really believe that the purpose of this movement was the unsealing of the seven thunders. And the seven thunders are not seven events in Millerite history, right? They're not seven way marks, right? Which is what this movement taught for a long time. And um, Peter Plum had done a study showing that that didn't make any sense. And then I wrote a study explaining that he that we we had sure we had made a mistake in how we had understood the seven thunders. But if he understood it correctly, it would actually uh, support the conclusions that we we drew from Millerite history. That is, what happens in our history is the seven thunders they just seal up Millerite history. But in our history, when we understand the way marks, those way marks aren't thunders, right? The way marks in Miller, Millerite history are not thunders. They're sealed up by seven thunders, right? So this was a mistake Peter Plum made in trying to argue against those way marks. So he didn't really accept all the way marks in uh, Millerite history. And But I, we can see clearly that this unsealing of Millerite history is something that only this movement has. We're the only ones who understand Millerite history. We understand Samuel Snow's letters. That's only this movement. And not everyone in this movement. That is, not everyone in this movement understood Samuel Snow's letters or even cared about them. Right? So that was a, a problem. Jeff understood them. That's one of the reasons he accepted July 18, 2020, as he saw uh, the parallel, right, with Samuel Snow's letters and what was unfolding at that time. So that, that becomes an important point, this study of Daniel chapter 12 in connection with Revelation chapter 10. And so you can see here in the red that when, when Daniel looks, that this is the studying of symbols in Millerite history. Right. And so we see that word looked is 7200. That's half of 144,000. Right. And then um, so when what we see here is a chiasm that's being represented right? With Christ in the middle, right? So there's one on one side of the bank of the river, one on the other, and on the waters of the river, you see Christ, right? He's the man clothed in linen. So we're saying that this is representing the understanding of structural chronological chiasms. So we're going to say that this, uh, how long shall be the end of these wonders? That is the end of the prophetic periods from 1798 to 1844. And we're saying that that's 1989 to the Sunday law. Right? So that's what we come to understand. That's that's the present truth application, the present truth answer, I guess. And then he's going to swear by him that liveth forever and ever. That word swear 7650 to declare an oath seven times. So we're saying that that's the understanding of the 2520 prophetic mirror. And it shall be four time times and a half. We can see, well, that's the 1260 years of paganism. Uh, but we're going to say that that history is the history of Adventism of the three generations. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, scatter the Jews until 538 AD, that's the scattering of the three angels' messages from 1844 to 1957. These things shall be finished, right? So you're going to have the arrival of the fourth generation in 1957. So you can see how this would parallel what's happening in Revelation 10 because it's the understanding of Millerite history and how it relates, how that, that history, that understanding is lost in the four generations. And that understanding then is revived with this movement beginning in 1989. And then we're going to see all the sealing up of the seven thunders, right? And then, of course, we have, well, I'll just read it here. So I heard the three angels, I heard, and the three angels' messages is expressed in the seven thunders of Revelation 10. But I understood not. And Daniel represents the people in, of God in Millerite history that are sealed in Revelation 10, right? Right, so that he's representing 144,000 of God's people. Then 
Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried. So we know that it goes back to that other verse in Daniel 11 that has these same words, but in a different order. But the wicked shall do wickedly, right? So you have the two classes, those that are purified, made white, and tried, and the wicked. So that deals with the everlasting gospel, right? And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and I should always do this, I don't know, shall be taken away. So we're going to say that's December 25th, 508, the baptism of Clovis, that's well understood. And the abomination that make it desolate set up, it's going to be obviously 538. We, we parallel these to December 25th, 1991, and December 25th, 2021. So that's that 30-year period. There shall be 1,290 days. So um, there was this uh, July 18, 1290 is the Edict of Expulsion on Tishba'av. Tishba'av is the ninth day of the fifth month, which the Jews celebrate or commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem on the 10th day of the fifth month. Still never been able to figure out why they use the ninth day, but uh, I've seen different explanations. So we're just saying that parallels July 18, 2020 in our history. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,309 305 and 30 days. So that's going to be April 19th or the first day of the first month in 1844, right? That uh, that you come to the 1335. And we're saying that brings us to 9-11 in November 9th, 2019 in our history. But go thy way, right? You can see obviously why 9-11 and November 9th are connected as symbols and they represent the first day of the first month, both of them. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So October 22nd, 1844, right, uh, historically, in that period up to there. And uh, we put that with July 18, 2020, the parallel of July 18th. So you've got the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. So Daniel stands in his lot in that period of time which is the symbol that's 187 days, right? Does that make sense? So it's a lot of detail, but, but the general idea is that we can look at Daniel, we can see the historical application is very solid. There's lots of details, you know, we didn't touch on, and that we can see the parallels in symbolic language to our history. Now, we're not saying when, when we make these applications in red, but that's the only application that can be made of these verses in the present truth application. It is an application that we made that we can see in regard to this movement. I do believe that there is a larger application on a bigger line, but that's not what we've been given shown here. That's not what we've been given as far as making an application. We made the application to our history through the symbolic use of numbers to speak to us about our movement, right? But that wouldn't be the message we would give to the world, you know, about all this stuff that happened in our movement that they don't know anything about, right? So the historical application is the most important here, but we do see these parallels to our history. A any comments on this, that uh, things that we should bring out? I know, Dwight, what are, what are you going to do tomorrow in presenting? You said you had some documents that you're going to look at. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing, hang with me for just a second. All right, what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, I've got some documents that you'll receive here in a few minutes that are part of a presentation that another party has posted on the Internet. Now, he'd asked me to look this over. I've been asked by a second person to look this over. And I'd like kind of a, a, a group mind examination of what he has presented. Some of what he said 
is very much in line with what we're discussing right now. Some of what he said, I don't know that I agree with. Okay. Now, so you're going to, how so, long do you think it's going to take you to go through this, these document, this document? So well, what you, okay, there are three documents. Okay. So you had said that you might not be available again until Tuesday. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, I won't be back. Uh, let me see this week. No, yeah, let me think here. Yeah. So this week, I'm going to be there Sunday and Monday. Okay. But I won't be here from Tuesday on. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, next week, I'm not here. Okay. And and also uh, the following Sunday and the Monday after that. So so then I'll be back on the Tuesday after that. So just to, to make this clear. And and so this this is dealing with Daniel chapter 11. Is that what this is, the, the document you're going to be looking at? Yes. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to be gone the 22nd, the 23rd, the 24th. I'm back on the 25th and 26th and 27th. No, 26th. And then I'm gone the 27th to the 2nd of September. I'm gone all that time. So I'm gone for, for seven days again. So I'm going to be gone for, for three days. I'll be back for two days, and then I'll be gone for seven days. Okay. Okay, so then, yeah, so September 3rd, then I'll be back without interruptions. But, okay, so, yeah, so we just do what you can. I mean, obviously, I'll, I'll try to watch uh, what you present tomorrow. I'll try to watch it uh, when I get back before Sunday morning, and then I'll be here Sunday and, and Monday. But you're just going to present those, and then, and, uh, and then I'll be gone. So... However, we're going to do this. I don't know, but but that's the end of our end of our summary, and um, so we'll just see what happens. Okay. Any other thoughts before we close with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study uh, that we have had in um, Daniel's last vision, and we ask for your continued help as we we seek your presence each day. We pray for one another. We know the struggles and trials that we all face, and they're different for each person. They're based upon our need uh, for dependence upon you. So we just ask for your angels' care and protection and that we can have peace with you and uh, with one another. I pray for each person uh, who is studying these things on the Internet, that your Holy Spirit can guide and lead them and that uh, we can see that there's still much that we don't understand and many things that need to be corrected in our understanding. So we're open to be taught of you in your spirit and, and in the fellowship we have with each other. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.